Hello and welcome to a video explaining the story behind Dan Buster Studios' zombie killing epic, Dead Island 2. First off, an absolutely massive thank you to Epic Games for sponsoring this video. In this game, the player will take on the role of one of six zombie killing machines or Slayers. Londoner and stuntman Jacob, Bruno, a Los Angeles native and hustler, Carla, a former motorcycle stunt rider, Danny, a former roller derby player from Ireland, Ryan, a male stripper from Fresno in search of his missing brother, and Amy, a super athletic Paralympian. Featuring a pulp storyline with over the top and quirky but charismatic characters, along with iconic moments, makes for a supreme extremely fun and unforgettable experience. The Slayer you choose will be slaying Zomboids mercilessly whilst rampaging through the streets of Los Angeles, accurately termed in this case, Hell A. Featuring iconic locations such as Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Venice Beach, Ocean Avenue and of course, the dingy sewer systems too. Speaking of zombies, there are plenty of them around to dismember and splatter all over the floor thanks to Dan Buster's incredible flesh dismemberment system and it is spectacular. If you decide a zombie doesn't need their legs, then just shoot one of them off. This is helped in large part by an awesome crafting and weapons modification system. Machete not packing enough of a punch? Well, stick a corrosive pump on it and watch those zombies just melt away. Make crazier weapons and get even crazier results. You'll need to upgrade your weapons too, as different and tougher infected Los Angelinos such as crushers, slobbers, screamers, butchers and mutators also roam the streets of Hell A. Make sure to go and pick up your copy for an amazing experience. But that being said, Let's discuss the story. June 2019, an outbreak of some kind has occurred in Los Angeles and many people are infected, turning them into flesh-eating zombies. The city is in the process of being evacuated by the military, as opposed to most games. In this one, you don't really see straight away what caused the outbreak. The outbreak itself has coincided with strange tremors and earthquakes which have been shaking the city for days. Various checkpoints have been set up in the city in an attempt to get healthy people out of the city and to relative safety. The entire city has been plunged into absolute chaos, which leads us to the point that the game takes place. A plane is scheduled to depart from Hell A, with entry passes needed in order to get past the military. Ticket for this particular flight cost a lot of money, 150k to be exact. Now it's here that we meet our six playable characters, or slayers. Amy, the Paralympian, arrives at the checkpoint and reveals that she ran 20 kilometers through the infected after she gave up her seat in Long Beach. That's of course a lie. Then we meet Ryan, the male stripper who, after being stranded in Los Angeles, needs to get back to Fresno. He uses his firefighter stripper get up, grabs a fire extinguisher, therefore disguising himself as a legitimate emergency worker, and then heads for a checkpoint where he meets upon a shuttle bus with Amy, where they both see people getting attacked by infected on buses. Bruno, the con man and hustler, stands at a checkpoint and experiences one of these tremors, sneakily takes a photo of the boarding pass of the poor schmuck behind him and gains entry in order to get evacuated. Then we see Carla, the motorcycle stunt rider, who obviously jumping a barricade basically just walks onto the plane. The plane is then forced into an early takeoff after a violent tremor threatens to prevent them from doing so, made worse by the fact that the walls are down and the infected are getting through the barricades. After takeoff, we meet our final two slayers. Jacob, the Londoner and stuntman who managed to climb aboard via the landing gear, where inside the cargo hold he meets up with Danny, the roller derby player from Ireland, who after being in LA for a roller derby had managed to get on board via hiding in a flight case. They then join the rest of the passengers. They're all elated that they managed to get away and leave Hell A. A celebrity is also on board, Emma Jaunt, a Hollywood movie star, along with her husband Robert Steele and her assistant Michael. Well, Robert isn't well at all, as a fan soon finds out. Robert attacks the woman and all hell breaks loose on the plane. The plane is going down whilst a man kills a zombie on the ground as the plane flies overhead. Then the plane crashes. Our protagonist wakes up and is injured so he needs a med kit and luckily finds one nearby. It seems that no one is alive after the crash, but our protagonist sees someone who quite bizarrely seems to disappear. Then the protagonist hears voices outside the door. Opening it and venturing outside, they find three survivors. It's the actress, Emma Jaunt, along with her assistant, Michael, and a guy, bleeding from his ear, called Ronnie. The situation is perilous, and they hear roaring sounds coming from inside the wreckage. Emma, Michael, and Ronnie leave, and the protagonist stays with two more survivors whilst fighting off infected. It doesn't end well for our protagonist, though, as one of the survivors is now turned into a zombie and then bites our protagonist and kills the other man. Thankfully, the protagonist has somewhere to go, as Emma wrote her address on their arm, 66 Alpine Drive in Bel Air. They climb the hill, struggling, and see LA completely overrun. This truly is Hell A. 
Later arriving in Bel Air, the protagonist crosses through an absolutely massive house belonging to a celebrity named Colt Swanson. Colt is unfortunately no longer with us. And then the protagonist eventually arrives at Emma's house. Stumbling through the door, they realise that our protagonist has indeed been bitten. Emma's housekeeper Andrea grabs the gun and threatens to shoot. A disagreement over who should shoot the protagonist takes place just as they pass out. Good news, they're not dead. As they wake up, and even better news is that our character is not a zombie. For some reason, they survive the bite, which is healing. However, the house is about to be overrun, so our hero heads outside to fight the infected off and closes the gates, securing the property. Quick chat at the bar with Michael and Emma is cut short by banging coming from the next room. A man bursts in, the man we saw earlier on. He's Emma's ex-boyfriend and some of you may recognise him. It's Sam B of Dead Island One fame and also the artist who created the hit song Who Do You Voodoo. More importantly, Sam explains that the reason for the protagonist not turning is because they are immune just as he is. Sam is there to get Emma out of LA and explains that the zombie stuff happened twice already and got covered up. Our protagonist says that they should spread the word and that they are both immune, but Sam replies that's a great way to end up dissected. Nonetheless, our character is nothing if not headstrong, so they've set out to find the authorities in an attempt to help them with a cure. A chat with Emma before they head out reveals there's an evacuation centre at a hotel called the Halperin Hotel, so our protagonist heads there. Expecting to find the military there, that isn't really the case. Everyone is dead and the checkpoint is, like most things in the city, overrun. Inside the hotel, the protagonist hears a radio call from someone referring to themselves as a Dr. Reed. The radio is behind a locked military door inside a ballroom, but the message says that a group of survivors are holed up at another hotel called the Serling Hotel in Santa Monica. Our protagonist is contacted by a major booker, who seems pretty riled up and threatens to kill them. The protagonist needs to find a way into the ballroom, so attempts to find Major Booker. What they find around the back of the hotel shocks them a swimming pool filled with a corrosive acid-like substance named Caustic X. Judging from documents scattered about, the military were dissolving deceased infected bodies in the acid and then funneling the waste into the sewer systems underneath Los Angeles. This was done under the supervision of Major Booker, who actually wrote to her commanding officer, demanding they carry out a more forceful approach to execute infected before they turn. It turns out that the Major is hammered drunk and is in room 307. Bizarrely, the Major is seemingly directing insults at not our protagonist, but a bride called Becky, who was scheduled to get married at the hotel, but the Major put a stop to their wedding when the outbreak started, but Becky wasn't having it. Reaching the Major, well, she's been torn apart by something. Eventually reaching the ballroom, our protagonist uses the radio and speaks to Dr. Reed. He says that he's part of the CDC, Center for Disease Control in Los Angeles. He sounds shocked that the protagonist is immune, and tells them that they are needed for a vaccine program. Their conversation is interrupted as the protagonist is confronted by the something that tore the Major apart. It's Becky and she's very, very angry. Eventually defeating Becky, the bride, the protagonist returns to Emma's place and informs them of the new developments and that they all need to leave for the Serling Hotel in Santa Monica. One problem, Michael isn't at the house, he's gone out. The protagonist sees an explosion in the distance and leaves to go and find Michael who lives in Beverly Hills. Upon arriving at Michael's house, there are signs that Michael handled himself quite well against some zombies but nonetheless, Michael's whereabouts are still a mystery. Investigation reveals that Michael was packing but got interrupted and had to hightail it out of there. After meeting the lead singer of Gods and Whiskey and rescuing and talking to Michael's friend and neighbour Jesse Kwan, she reveals that Michael went to a place called Monarch Film Studios, so our protagonist heads there next. Arriving, there's still no sign of him, but as usual, infected are everywhere. Our protagonist needs to get to Emma Jorn's trailer, as she was there at one point before the outbreak filming something at Monarch Studios. Fighting through the various sets, it's clear that Michael was being pursued by something, but eventually they get to Emma's trailer. Michael greets our protagonist by nearly attacking them with a fire extinguisher. He was being pursued by a huge zombie, a person named Elisis Hernandez, who has evolved to the point that its bloated state causes her to spit caustic X. After dealing with the creature, Michael reveals that he left in order to obtain medical supplies, but he's acting a bit strange. Sam contacts them over the radio and tells them that he's in Beverly Hills and he's found some guns. Michael stays there in the trailer for now and our protagonist heads to the hills and meets up with Sam and fellow plane crash survivor Ronnie. While Sam is fighting off infected, Ronnie gets acquainted with Nikki, the owner of this house. She's infected of course, but not only that, she is another variant called a screamer, and when she sings, the whole area is going to know about it, as poor Ronnie finds out. He gets covered in glass and gets a good nibbling. 
After taking all the zombies and avenging Ronnie with some target practice, Sam tells the protagonist to meet him back at Emma's, so that's where they head next. But arriving back, it's bad. Michael has been bitten. A power struggle takes place. Emma is extremely protective of Michael, but something needs to be done. Emma isn't happy, but Michael reanimates, and our protagonist takes him out, leading to Emma kicking them out of the house. Sam gives them a tip and says that they should use a sewer system to get around, and that it will eventually take them to Santa Monica. Time for our protagonist to meet another variant, a burster. All of a sudden, a friend comes to the aid of the protagonist and kicks back the burster, takes cover, and the burster blows up. They both get inside a doorway and the man hits a switch and blows up a load more infected. This man introduces himself as Patton. He's a former US Army chopper pilot, badly burned after his chopper was shot down, and it's safe to say he's an Emma Jaunt super fan. Patton wants to watch an Emma Jaunt movie, Omen to Kill, with the protagonist, but unfortunately the protagonist has got stuff to do. They pass through Patton's hideout into the Brentwood sewer system. From here on out, it's an eventful journey to say the least. They follow the signs to the Venice storm tank and meet lots of infected along the way. After opening the gate, they enter the storm tank and appear to enter into some sort of nest. It's covered in a fleshy substance and the protagonist comments on it seeming alive. A note states that the workers in the tunnels reported clearing it out of the tunnels, but it just kept on coming back. A worker stated that he stuck his hand in and saw fingers. He then got scratched by something and then, well, you can probably guess what happened next. Truth is, remember the dissolved bodies that the army were disposing of at the Halperin Hotel into the sewers? Well, the remains ended up down here, and those remains were quickly mutating and growing into something else entirely. Anyway, after a tense chase through the tank, the protagonist makes it to safety. Dr. Reed calls, and the protagonist tells him about the fleshy substance in the sewers. Reed says, the missing biomass, and that's why it didn't add up. Then he quickly changes the subject. Don't worry, we'll get to that later on. The end is in sight, but of course, the bridge starts to collapse, and then a woman approaches. She says she's been looking for the protagonist, who then starts to see and experience some trippy stuff. Do you feel that oh, wow. pulsing in your marrow? <laughs> like a promise. You brought friends. <laughs> Look! I don't know who the fuck you are, but I gotta go. There's a doctor in Santa Monica waiting on me and my immune blood. You've got your eyes wide shut. Clinging to the edge of the pool. Too afraid of drowning. I'm gonna have to help you let go. The fuck are you? That was unexpected, but eventually, daylight. The protagonist has made it to Venice Beach. This place is in a sorry state too. This is where all the buses for the evacuations ended up. The buses themselves have been fitted with bars to protect the drivers in case of an infective passenger, termed red level infections. Being signaled by a group of survivors on top of a building, the protagonist goes in to meet them all. These are the Blue Crab Boys who have been hiding out in the Blue Crab Bar and Grill. One of the guys, Bud, is taunting another, saying that he can't see any of his swole mates out there. The annoying guy says the protagonist has no hope of getting to the Serling Hotel, as it's heavily militarized, and they'll have to pass through that zone in order to get there. It's an evac zone and there are thousands of infected trapped inside. Then, just as Bud is mouthing off again, he is grabbed and killed by a swole zombie. The protagonist is then contacted by Emma over the radio. She appears to be trying to apologize. A chat with Alex leads to our protagonist hunting down Alex's two infected friends, Moose and Dylan. In the gym, they meet up with Patton again, who is doing something to an infected. It's Moose. Hey. What is up? <laughs> Believe it or not, you're gonna wanna see this. You pull a rabbit out of there, I'm a flip. <laughs> Dude, it's oh, Moose. Oh, yeah. You knew him? No, no, no worries. Just oh. a friend of a friend. 
Ah, uh, he wasn't human anymore. Uh, uh, and that's the point. Look at this. What is that? Ugh. Wrong question, my friend. What you should be asking is, what does it do? I should? You sure? You see this? A tiny hammer? <laughs> A tiny hammer now. But... <sighs> Behold, Excalibur! Yeah, Apricadabra Alakazam! Good to see you again, man, but I gotta split. Busy taking down more no, of those nasty. No, wait, wait. It's, it's just like in the movies. What? <laughs> Boop! <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> I know, right? It's insane! All this stuff, it does things. The protagonist eventually finds Dylan and eventually defeats him. Back at the Blue Crab, Alex says to go to the army base on the beach through the quarantine corridor to the lifeguard tower and then to follow the signs for the green zone. Easy, right? The protagonist heads into the army base, which unsurprisingly is abandoned, after a huge earthquake triggered the base to be locked down after infected started to come up from below. The protagonist then finds the quarantine corridor after lifting the lockdown. They then arrive at a lifeguard tower. A soldier inside the tower tells them not to enter the tower, or they'll send a squad after them, but climbing the tower, it turns out that this soldier, or an officer Rodriguez, is all alone up there. True to what the guys at the Blue Crab said, there are indeed thousands of infected trapped inside the evac zone. Anyway, the gate is open to the final quarantine corridor, and after slaughtering loads more infected, the way is now open to Ocean Avenue and to the Serling Hotel. Anyway, reaching the Serling Hotel, which is actually situated inside a shopping complex, the protagonist finally meets Dr. Reuben Reed. He's holed up there with a bunch of survivors, including his daughter Tisha. Reed says he wants to take our protagonist to Colorado, to the CDC. Tisha comes in and says that she wants to help the others get food, but then an argument kicks off as Reuben doesn't want his daughter being in danger. Dr. Reed then radios the CDC whilst the protagonist takes a rest and has a well-earned sleep. After their wonderful sleep and wanting to see Dr. Reed for an update, the door guard Denise tells them that Reed isn't there as someone got sick. In the meantime, a guy called Bob went missing after he went to fix the water supply. Bob is, well, infected, but the water supply gets fixed. The doc is now back, so the protagonist goes for a chat. Unfortunately, the CDC isn't in charge anymore, the military are. They won't extract to Colorado unless they have proof that our protagonist is immune. They want to make sure that the virus is contained within Los Angeles and that it can't get out. Which is also why the plane was shot down in the opening sequence, because the military didn't want the virus leaving Los Angeles. Our protagonist needs to go to Santa Monica Pier, to the CDC headquarters in order to access a machine which can test their blood for the immunity. Arriving at the facility, it's completely abandoned. But this place holds a ton of important information about what had happened during the outbreak. This board here states the figures. The total population inside the quarantine area was 6 million. After all the processed dead, people evacuated, those awaiting evacuation, and the observed infected, there were 1 million people unaccounted for. But where did they all go? Again, we'll get to that a bit later. The infection also had a name, the autophage, a blood-borne infection transmitted via fluid transmission, i.e. bites. Mobile morgues were also set up here, mostly for autopsy purposes. That is until the body started reanimating and attacking CDC staff. A symptom checker named Turbos was coined, temperature, uncommunicative, rapid breathing and ocular stigmata. And then a chilling note from the staff, the corpses are not dead. What's more is that the infection, the autophage, is essentially a biomass and is constantly growing just like the one down in the sewers. It's producing new organs and structures inside the body, organs like the one Patton pulled out of an infected. In the dome, the infected had been studied extensively. They'd been x-rayed, chopped up and dissected, and each stage of the infection observed. Runners, walkers, bursters, screamers and more. Anyway, the machine that is needed is there at the complex, and after powering it up, the protagonist sticks their arm inside it and it takes a blood sample, producing a vial of something. They then need to grab a blood drive from a lifeguard station near the Santa Monica Pier off of another doctor named Dr. Bundy. They get there, but the bad news is that Dr. Bundy isn't there, meaning that the blood drive must be all the way down at the end of the pier. Of course it is. Not only that, but the pier is also locked down and Bundy has the key. Heading towards the pier to try and find Bundy, it's not long before he's located, and he's mutated into a massive fat zombie. 
and Julie gets taken out. The protagonist grabs the keycard and enters the pier, but surprise, surprise, the way forward is not accessible due to a collapsed walkway. They enter an arcade and power up a door, which also powers up all the rides on the pier and sets off fireworks too, and that has attracted some attention. But after getting rid of more infected, the protagonist manages to use the ferris wheel to cross over to the other side. However, they are attacked by a strange and potentially deadly clown zombie, a variant called a hunter. Making it to the end of the pier, the blood drive is there and it works, thankfully. But the killer zombie clown turns up and is itching for a fight, and the protagonist gladly takes it down, and then after trying to avoid another collapsing walkway, they get thrown into the water and thankfully wash up on the beach. They then head back to the hotel. Reed is there with the woman that our protagonist met in the sewers. They start to have more weird sensations again, almost as if reacting to her. He introduces her as Lona Conrad. Turns out they used to work together, researching. She mentions her being Reuben's Pythia. A Pythia is essentially an oracle. In her case, she provided Reuben with information, but on what isn't really clear. Yet. Something strange is going on here as Reuben says that Lola promised she wouldn't interfere, but interfere with what? A guy called Jimmy Montana, another famous actor who starred in The Badge, bursts in. Turns out that Tisha did go out looking for supplies, and Reuben is worried and furious. Reuben pleads with the protagonist to find Tisha while the blood drive analyzes the blood sample. They find Tisha and she is holed up with her friends in an apartment that they don't want anyone else to know about. The protagonist is curious about what exactly Reuben's motives are, and it seems that Tisha and her friends are too. Tisha left the hotel because her and her friends were curious about what Reuben is up to. Tisha then makes the protagonist a deal. If she doesn't take her back to the hotel, she'll give them a direct line to Lola Conrad. Tisha explains that there's currently a data blackout, no internet or anything, but they have found packets of data flowing between the CDC and a place called the Rangate building. The protagonist is to go to an OSK store, which is a large electronics and tech company, and enter a catchphrase. K in OSK actually stands for Conrad, so yeah, there's the connection to Lola. The protagonist boots up the servers and gets everything back online and says the catchphrase. The unit spits out a word, eschaton, which essentially means doomsday or the end of the world. The unit then plays a conversation between Dr. Reed and a guy named Noah. Hey, I'm Dr. Reed, but you can call me Ruben. Noah, they told me there's something in my blood that... Yeah, yeah, shh, shh. Let's keep your... Uh... Specialness, just between us for now, okay? Uh, okay, sure. But it's about a cure? If our preliminary results are right, then you have a miracle in your blood. Now that we've found you, humanity stands a chance. Cool. So, what happens to me? You just take some blood, or...? We need to get you to our lab on Ocean Avenue. We have the equipment there, and answers to all your questions, I promise. Okay, you're the doctor. Someone else is immune? Why would it Reed tell me this? The protagonist is then able to track down the lab that Dr. Reed mentioned. It's pretty creepy. They find the aforementioned Noah strapped to an operating table. He's clearly the result of some sick experiment that went wrong. As we previously heard, Noah was also immune. The protagonist realizes that they are next in line for whatever this experiment is. Opening the blood drive, which displays that it belongs to a group called the Eschaton Group, Something happens to Noah. He starts to reanimate and then transforms into a super tough variant known as a mutator. He doesn't last long though as our protagonist has one of their fury episodes again. But then Tisha arrives and they go after her too. Tisha stabs them with an arrow and runs off. They come to and Lola, Conrad and her friends are standing over them. Lola tells one of them to check the blood drive but then Lola mentions a rebirth and that they are rare and the protagonist is one of them. They're all what's known as Newman, which is essentially the Latin word for divinity or divine presence. Lola mentions that they are humanity distilled. She then mentions a cataclysm coming to the world, a large scale violent event, and that only the Newman can carry humanity through this event. Lola breaks the news to the protagonist that Reuben isn't actually making a cure at all. This is simply because he cannot. Humans and the autophage he called the Newman. She goes on to describe it as a life cycle spanning countless eons. Wanting answers from Dr. Reed and approaching the hotel, the protagonist sees a chopper taking off and they go to Dr. Reed's office. Ruben and Tisha just flew out of here. Asshole. He didn't say anything? Not a damn thing. Jimmy's trying to figure it out. Ah, oh, cool. Wish me luck, I'm going in. What's happening, Jimmy? Fucking piece of shit. I know what you did. Hey, dude, take it easy. It's all in there. Ruben, Esther, Shacklin, whatever the fuck that is, and your name over 
and over. You all started the outbreak. What? You're I... fucking psycho! I don't know shit! He kept me in the dark, too. He told me they'd make a vaccine from my blood. I just wanted to get the hell out of here. He killed my city. I should have put a bullet in him. No! Estupido! We could have found out where he's gone. I know where he's gone. He's flown to some lab on Hollywood Boulevard. Time to call it quits. Emma? Emma Jaunt? It's me. You there? Hello? Did your doctor get you out? Nope. He fucked me over. We're gonna make our own way. There's a helicopter in Hollywood Boulevard. And I know a pilot who's your biggest fan. You gotta... persuade him to fly. Persuade him to... Hey, if you think I'm gonna fuck some creep so you can fly out of here... Hey, come on, man. You really think I'd ask that? He can get us all out. You just gotta give him a pep talk. He's been living in the sewers for, like, decades. Oh, that's splendid. We'd have more chance on a magic carpet. Everyone's fucked us. The army, the doctor. They're probably recasting you already. Bet they are, the wankers. Okay, I'll meet him. But no promises. He's in the big sewer pipe by your house. I'm leaving now. Can't wait. Going back to the sewers again, the protagonist introduces Emma and Sam to Patton. After getting over being slightly starstruck, he, although hesitant at first due to the chopper crash that almost killed him, agrees to fly Dr. Reed's chopper out of Los Angeles. They need to get through a quarantine door in the metro, but the door closes on the protagonist before they can get through. Not to worry though, they find an alternate route and eventually join up with the others in Hollywood Boulevard metro station. More good news is that they find the chopper. Whose bird is this anyway? This doctor. I thought he was a good guy, wanted my blood to cure the outbreak, but it turns out he actually kind of started it. What? What? Every fucking time! Hey, it doesn't matter. Ancient history. The authorities can figure out all this crazy shit once we're out of here. Works for me. Let's go. This... this isn't right. The heroes don't run away at the end. They see things through. Real life isn't like the movies. You think I don't know that, huh? The movies show us how we could be. If we were better people. Sam, will you just tell him? Sam! He's burning up. We have to fly him out. Come on. No. I'm staying here. It must be different shit this time. Hollywood Boulevard. Time was I given anything for my name on the walk. So focused on fame, I lost what really matters. You and me both. Emma? If he flips, we got to... Shh. I know. The protagonist follows the trail of Tisha's arrows, and it leads to a reaging clinic. Searching the back office reveals a secret door leading to the autophage and gestation labs. It's the Eschaton Laboratory. The protagonist then confronts Dr. Reed. You don't understand! Tisha, it's me! I'm not a zombie! What are you then? Yeah, why don't we find out? What am I, Doc? You infected the city! People I loved! All of them! Dad? What did you do? I... I... What did you do? I killed millions to save billions! Why? Why did you do this? Because you were so rare! Only one in a million becomes a Newman, an autophage hybrid. I... I couldn't complete the cure without you! The cure's worse than the disease. No! No! 
the autophage isn't an illness, all right? 25 years ago, I, I found a clock hidden in our DNA, counting down to the day of our extinction. When the clock hits zero, the autophage will erupt in every man, woman, and child on Earth. I, I had to stop it. It's in everyone? Yeah, we weren't built to last. Take that. Conrad thinks the out of age exists to create the new weapon. Your anomaly's the best. Puppets are worst. I can hear them, feel them. We're joined. Joined by what? What does it want? I. I can only spare a few drops, but it'll neutralize the autophage, make you human again, all right? Now just go! Go! I can't hold on much longer! No! Use it on yourself! Sweetheart. Sweetheart. You don't know what else I did. I modified an unborn baby. With the Newman blood, she becomes the cure. <laughs> to be harvested every day for the rest of her life. I mean, I've, I've taken everything from you. I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, ah, get, get her up. Get her out of LA! Before I... I know what happens next. We gotta go. Don't touch me! Disha, We have to go! Now! The protagonist fights and disposes of the mutated Dr. Reed and fights their way out of the lab. They make it back to the chopper. You seen Tisha? Huh? Who? A girl with a crossbow. Oh, I haven't seen anyone. The doctor? Dead. Yeah. Goodbye. Again? Wait, wait! It's what I deserve. This time, there's another way. I got a one-shot cure from the lab. It was meant for me, but... I don't need it. Sam does. <sighs> Not his head, you idiot! Ay, puta. My bad. come back for you. Uh, for some reason, I'm starving. Got any of that pastrami? Perfect. I gotta get going. You guys go. There's a girl out there. She's the cure. She could really use a friend. Go save the world. Thanks, man. Thank you. We won't waste this. Good, Good luck. luck. <laughs> Just 
to stink it. And it's done. Cadenza? The song is incoherent. Decided to stay with us? For... For Tisha. That the only reason? And that is the end of the game's main storyline. Not the best ending, but a decent storyline nonetheless. It was a little bit of a head scratcher in places, but I found some of the documents in the game and managed to piece together a little bit of what exactly happened in the lead up to the outbreak. So as Dr. Reed mentioned 25 years prior, he mentioned that he discovered a ticking clock inside the human body, or rather inside human DNA. A ticking clock which cannot be safely removed as much like a mousetrap, for example, if one component is removed, then it simply cannot operate. Not everyone's clocks are the same either, they tick down at different times. Reed discovered that the first population's clocks to hit zero would do so in or around 2160, so although there's over 100 years left before that happens, time is of the essence. Remember the Dead Island 1 pathogen termed HK? Well, in October of 2010, Reed had a retrovirus carrier of HK1. Reed, using this subject, found a way to spoof the zero clock state in human cells. Problem is that once this process was completed, it was damn near impossible to spot which cells had their DNA rewritten. The CDC would need to carry out live trials on volunteers using the HK1 pathogen in the hope that they could capture some of what they termed the God cells and they bought dialysis devices known as blood drives. They then began to prepare to research their six volunteers. In order to carry out further research, the CDC then acquired a facility which was in the middle of the ocean, and that way any outbreak could be contained within the facility and wouldn't escape. Smart. And that was a good thing because at one point there was an outbreak. This outbreak occurred in November 2010. Unfortunately for the researchers, their attempts to research the six volunteers ended up with them all dying. But then the subjects reanimated and tore through the facility. The majority of the research facility staff were killed, but the core team were adrift in the sea for nine days, eventually being rescued. After some recuperation, Reed realized that humans are one aspect of a bimodal organism, a species not too unlike the Roman god Janus. The time for humans as we know them is coming to an end, and another species is ready to take over, the autophage, which is actually defined as something that is self-eating, devouring, and consuming. Reed goes on to state that the deceased turn into animated zombie vectors with one purpose, to consume all things human. It's the end of the world and of humanity. Not being able to find more volunteers for their research and with time running out, Reed got desperate. He unleashed the HK1 virus into Los Angeles. It was all planned, even the military higher ups were clued in. This explains how they managed to put up barricades and quarantines so fast. They pre-ordered a load of Caustic X and had it delivered to the Halperin because they knew this was all going to happen. Researchers and soldiers even comment how they have no idea where all the quarantine equipment came from so fast. He hoped that with that many infected, there were bound to be some immune individuals somewhere. Reed and two of his screening teams, Zephron and Bundy, went to the CDC HQ facility set up by the pier in Santa Monica, but eventually that got overrun, and relocated to the Serling Hotel afterwards. Reed, at some point in his past, experimented on an unborn baby who would become his daughter, Tisha, and she would have the burden of being harvested every day. It's not clear how Tisha was born, but in Dr. Reed's goodbye letter to her, he states that it didn't matter how she was made. It's very likely that Tisha was made from both Reed and Lola Conrad, which explains why Tisha is so special, and also why Lola says that her and Reed working together was much more than just co-researchers. This is where Noah also came in, but of course we know how that ended up. He died in the Santa Monica lab after the test fried the equipment and he died. Another candidate was found too, but he turned into a burster. And this leads to our protagonist being the next immune candidate for Dr. Reed. You remember the conversation in the sewers where Reed says this. It's Carla. It's fucking crazy down here. All the dissolved bodies they flushed away are like growing it, turning into something totally fucked up. The missing biomass. That's why you didn't add up. What? Doesn't matter now. You need to get out of there. You mentioned a biomass and it being missing. Well, given that the military were pumping the dissolved remains of the deceased infected down to the sewer system, 
and that those remains were mutating down there. This log confirms why Reed was so surprised by hearing about the growths in the sewers. This is where the missing 1 million unaccounted people were. As for the quakes, a side mission reveals to us that the quakes and tremors weren't happening along the fault lines. A team of seismologists were sent out to investigate and found the biomass growths in the sewer systems. They found tendrils growing out of the biomass and into the ground, and the heat and pressure were what was causing the seismic activity, and these coincided with LA being overrun by infected. The different variants were actually created as a result of testing by Reed's colleagues in the Eschaton labs. They were kept in these containment units, which were sealed with aerogel, and they coined these variants Apex variants. They actually surmise that the type of variant that the subject will evolve into is linked to natural geomagnetic forces, more specifically heliospheric and galactic currents. It's very complicated. The research team eventually gained the ability to grow whichever variant they desired by manipulating the specific magnetic resonance frequencies, and despite this, they were never able to revive a subject into becoming a Newman. Because that ability is already written into the subject's DNA, as seen with our protagonist and their immunity. This is why Reed was so desperate to discover the secrets of the Newman, because I guess they were the key to sustaining humanity. As for the other Slayers, when the chosen protagonist is about to leave for the sewers, they see the sheets of paper on the desk. It seems that Reed had already been in contact with some of the other Slayers too, as they too were immune of course. It's not clear whether or not they actually survived. As for Tisha, I'm not really sure whether she got out of Los Angeles or not, but maybe the story will be expanded upon in a future DLC. Who knows? But anyway, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, then please leave a like, subscribe and leave a comment below with your thoughts. But for now, take care, and I will see you in the next one.